As the days go on without comment and rumors of an alleged affair mount, his squeaky clean reputation has been tarnished. A new study says the G-spot itself is fake, make-believe an urban myth, but when I spoke to people in a local sex shop, it aroused a lot of disbelief. Karen and Aaron come from completely different environments, yet they say fate brought them together. You can see it is still quite windy out here. We all know the saying, a tree grows in Brooklyn. Well, tonight, trees have fallen in Brooklyn. In the midst of fighting for her life, she and her supportive husband have raised over $2 million. You've heard the names all morning, but it is really going to be an event that is uh, going to be remembered for a very long time. It's uh, hard to believe the anniversary of the miracle on the Hudson is only a week away. Have you learned any, any style tricks from your daughter? Has she taught you anything? Um, yeah, I have, actually. Things look much better on her than they do on me. I think you look pretty darn good. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks. Why would American men and women choose to give up college and volunteer in a country constantly at war? You're about to meet a local young man just shy of his 21st birthday who left the nest for a fate unknown. Aaron Blaszkowski is choosing to be pushed around. He's a 21-year-old American who volunteered to serve in the Israeli army to become a man. I really felt like, uh, you know, this is where I needed to be. And don't get me wrong, I love America. I mean, I got a big American flag hanging on my wall. And Aaron grew up in Marlboro, New Jersey, the son of an Israeli father and an American mother. He's following in his father's footsteps to fight for a country the size of New Jersey that's surrounded by enemy nations. Israel faces a wide array of threats, which gives Israel a very complex situation which it has to deal with. And it all starts at bases like this one in the middle of the Negev desert. These men and women are only three months into basic training at the Nahal near the town of Arad. Every citizen in a country with the population of New York City has to serve in the military for three years starting at the age of 18. Congratulations. Thank you. How do you feel? I feel wonderful. Whoa, I feel yay. so good. Aaron got accepted to the Army last spring after he and his brother Eli made Aliyah, meaning they moved to Israel indefinitely. If you weren't here, I mean, what do you think, what do you think you'd be doing? Yeah, I'd be like any other American kid you ever met. I'd probably be going to college, getting drunk every night, you know, just... You know, up wasting, girls. Yeah, exactly, chasing girls. This is what's important to me, you know, and I'm happy here, and you, you gotta, at the end of the day, you just gotta weigh the pros and the cons. You'd be like, yeah, it would be fun there, there's, there's stuff I'm missing, but what I'm gaining here is just so much more worth it. Aaron's connection to Israel runs deep, as far back as the Holocaust. His father, Ami, moved to New Jersey after the Army to fulfill his father's dream of living a better life by raising a family in the U.S. Aaron's grandfather, Eliezer, was a Holocaust survivor who moved to Israel as an orphan and fought in the War of Independence in 1948. He's an amazing guy. He built all the communication towers from Beersheba to a lot that uh, they still use today. And uh, for all, for all, every, every uh, radio wave goes through these towers. <laughs> And it's that pride that makes fighting heat stroke in 100 plus degrees in the summer and battling hypothermia in the winter seem like a small price to pay. Aaron says the brotherhood with his fellow soldiers is priceless, even though he doesn't even speak the same language as some of them. And that camaraderie starts from the top. Unfortunately, enough wars for everyone. Base commander Captain Nadav Golden is only 24 years old. That's a lot of responsibility for someone who's 24 years old. I think that's one of the... The great things about the Israel army that everyone uh, goes through, he's not born a commander, he has to be a soldier first of all. And uh, when I speak to my soldiers, I know that uh, I was one of them. Even within the office, there's just so much laughter and joy and like, it's unbelievable that these people can just switch it on. You know, they could be so sweet and they could be so fun, but then when it's time to train and it's time to get tough, they can get tough. And it's, it's an amazing cultural aspect of Israel and of the Israeli people. Even though the goal of these soldiers is to avoid going to battle. Ben Gurion uh, said we do it not because we hate the enemy, we do it because we love our country. The reality is over a million of these men and women can be called to fight on a moment's notice. It's the last thing in the world I want to do is, you know, get shot at even shoot at somebody, but you know, I came here to be in the army, but I do believe that the Israelis are on the side of justice, so it's my justification in, in serving in the army and, and if I ever had to do something to defend it, in doing so. For Jennifer Goodman Lynn and her husband David, this is more than just a song to spin to. You're very high quality charity and a good purpose. Thank you.
It defines Jennifer's fight with abdominal cancer that today she found out has come back for a fifth time. Instead of tearing these soulmates apart, cancer has brought them even closer together. Would you say that you guys uh, are soulmates? Dave whispered in my ear, you have this type of cancer and we're going to beat it. And, you know, I had that one moment of, is this the guy who's going to get me through? And he absolutely has been. Fate brought them together at Harvard Business School when Dave wasn't even ready to meet Mrs. Wright. Somebody wanted to set us up, but uh, typical guy, didn't call her right away. I was in the mindset of meeting many a lot of people. I was waiting for the call that never came. So when it came eight months later, I was... Came a little late. That's all. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but it turns out they met by chance because Dave wanted her swank apartment on campus. There was a loophole in the lottery that if she would sign our name onto the lease before she moved out, we could get around the lottery. That was our first date. I had to convince her to give us the apartment. He didn't read the small writing in the lease that said, sure, you can have the apartment, but then you get me too for life. <laughs> <laughs> In 2003, these lovebirds got married and started their life in New York. Yeah, this is my favorite picture from our wedding because whenever there's an, a bump in the road, it reminds me that laughter will get us through. Well, that bump in the road came less than a year after they got married. Instead of getting pregnant, she got diagnosed with abdominal sarcoma. The doctor said, well, I'm, I wouldn't do that unless Dave is prepared to be a single father. And sort of the room went silent and we at that point realized how serious this fight was going to be. But after four rounds of chemo and surgery, Jennifer has never lost hope. I've, I've always been able to disassociate myself from the disease, meaning, you know, I always say I have cancer, but cancer doesn't have me. If you're going to have to go through cancer, you have to have fun. So every time I relapse, I buy another wig. So I'm on four instead now. Of shoes, instead of shoes, instead of I buy wigs. Lows, you're buying wigs. And there are a lot more money, i got to tell you. Or her sense of humor. And now this power couple has turned pain into purpose. Ooh, we're at two million and eighty thousand dollars. With this Sunday's fourth annual Cycle for Survival at Equinox Gym. In the past year, we've lost four or five friends. Why am I the lucky one? And that propels you. I mean, if I didn't keep helping, I would feel like I wasn't being responsible. Jen admits she's fearless in this fight and is already planning for when she wins the battle again. When you beat cancer again, yeah. This spring, you and I are going to go skydiving. I love it. Can we make that agreement? Can Absolutely. Shake on, it? shake on it. Nearly one year ago today, Captain Chesley Sullenberger was on a routine flight from LaGuardia Airport when something went terribly wrong. We're almost to the point where we hit the birds. In the new documentary, Brace for Impact, Captain Sully retraces the steps of U.S. Airways Flight 1549, which he safely landed in the Hudson River. We're out of time. We're out of airspeed. We're out of ideas. This is it. And tonight at the premiere, Captain Sully reunited with some of the 155 passengers whose lives he saved. What's it like to see everybody again? Oh, it's, it's great. It's, it's a reminder of such good news where everyone worked together and everyone was safe. There's nothing that bonds people together like going through what we went through and then getting to the other side. At this point, I don't even think I'm in. I'm out here in the water. In fact, that might be me right there. Denise Lockie and Rob Kolodje are two strangers who pulled together to rescue their fellow passengers, including Pam Siegel. I truly thought I could swim to Manhattan. I was, I was going. I helped pull her into our raft, and I remember her vividly swimming. She was absolutely white or gray, ashen colored, but she always had a composure about her. I was one of the first ones out, and actually I pulled people out from here, people that were in the water. So you're a hero too. Well, no, not as much as Mr. Sullenberger, believe me. I say this is the captain brace for impact. And even though tonight's reunion is a celebration of life, the memories of the fateful crash still haunt many of the survivors. How have you been able to move on and kind of put what happened out of your out of your daily memories? I don't think you can put it out of your it, it's it's there. It's constantly present. The reality is Almost a year ago, we could have lost our lives, and it is very challenging. It's, it's been a very tough year for me. I don't, like I say, not only emotionally, but physically. It really brings back 
memories that I don't want to think about anymore, you know? I just want to move ahead. Do you consider yourself a hero, like the rest of us do? You know, my crew and I did our jobs exceedingly well. But uh, at the same time, I know that we didn't choose to place ourselves in, at risk to save somebody else. This was thrust upon us. So I'm very happy to be the public face of something that makes people feel so hopeful. First stop, Nevada Smiths, where football is religion, even outside. USA! USA! On that note, I'm going inside to see all the action. But as I quickly found out, seeing all the action is no easy task, especially when the U.S. is playing. I don't know if you're going to get more grounded than this. I don't think I can even get through any farther. See, my hair just grew. It grew. It's so hot in there. There are flags everywhere, every country. Here's a bar. We're on 5th Street and 2nd Avenue. A bar there, a bar here. Go USA! Let's go see what this place is all about. USA! USA! Just as we walked into Soon Soon, the U.S. won the game in overtime. And English owner Richard York is counting on the U.S. and England playing in the finals. I would like to assure you all that uh, we'll beat you. We'll beat really? You. All right, I think we should make a wager right now. Right now, what do you want? We're going we're gonna to wager green card. How's that? I'll take it. <laughs> USA won. So as you can see, a lot of people very happy. And they've taken the party to the streets. Do you know where I could find a World Cup sports bar in Brooklyn or Queens by any chance? Yep, we created an app for it. You did? Yep. Jeremy Hollister created an app called NYC Game Finder, designed for World Cup fans. The next game playing is Ghana and Germany today at 2.30, so we can just search. Um, by venues that I found one uh, in uh, in Brooklyn, they're Schwartz Kohlner, and they're out on uh, on Fulton Street in Brooklyn. We made it to Fulton Street, home of Der Schwarze Kohlner Beer Garden. I have a feeling we're going to strike gold when it comes to finding Germany fans. Let's see if I'm right. What is your specialty beer for this Germany World Cup game? Specialty beer right now is Bitburger. And we serve them in the traditional Bitburger boots, actually, right? Wow. These are one liter beer. I have never seen anything like this. Owner Dale Hall imports all the beer directly from Germany. And fans, old and young, couldn't take their eyes off the nail-biter game. Are you the youngest Germany fan? Yeah. Are you reaching for me? a good time watching World Cup, but they do so sitting down. I think we're going to go over to Queens, see how people handle football there. Let's go. I'm here at Woodside, Queens, home of Sean Ogg's Bar. Let's see how many people are still watching the World Cup this afternoon. This bar was practically empty except for a couple soccer enthusiasts. From the likes of it, not too many World Cup fans in Queens. I think I know where I need to go. After our multi-borough tour of New York sports bars, hands down, there's really only one place to go to catch all the World Cup action, right here at Nevada Smiths. I'm going to go back inside, take a break from my day job. Emily Francis, PIX11 News.